So I'm here for another uh, quarantine interview, you know, uh, with Film Music Media. We're here with Anthony Willis, uh, composer of Promising Young Woman. Anthony, how's it going? It's good, thanks, Kai. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> I know. I miss you. I know. I miss and, you too, uh, man. I miss hanging out at your studio and <laughs> checking things out. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's really nice to, I've seen you kind of building these up over the years, and it's really, really cool to do one with you and Oh, of course, man. Stuff. So, so thank you for such an honor having me. You, you've been such yeah it's been just great talking with you over the years and and congrats to you i mean you've grown so much and have gotten accomplished so much recently and uh and of course congrats on promising young women i mean it's getting fantastic reviews and winning all these awards and stuff so congrats <laughs> well thank you you know I'm, I'm really lucky to have been a part of it it's such an interesting film it's such a it's making a huge cultural impact you know, I mean, 100%. so many of the films, so many of the films that I've been really lucky to be a part of either, you know, as additional music composer or otherwise, have been these amazing escapes, Yeah, which we all love about cinema, you know, like what John did for How to Train a Dragon, for example, and like taking you away to this mythical, you know, Viking universe. But what's really was cool for me with Promising Women is that it's, I mean, it's so in the now, it's so in the moment, it's so culturally relevant um and so i feel really lucky to to you know be a part of that absolutely well before we jump into that um you know let's uh let's uh, rewind the clocks back a little bit i'd love to kind of know uh you know kind of go back to your kind of origins and your background so talk about uh growing up and what were kind of the first moments you remember in your life where you got inspired by film or music and how did that kind of lead you to where you are today all right well i guess this is our first one so i should do like the, the, the beginning I mean I was all a, the way back <laughs> yeah funny enough I was a I was a quite a reluctant musician when I very first started out my older sister Alexandra was took piano lessons and she was two years older than me cleverer than me and uh better than me at the piano and so, you know having an older sibling be slightly better at something than you is always not that inspiring because you know your parents are thinking oh they, you've got this amazing role model and you're kind of like well she's don't doing that I need to find something else I can do and you know I think I I found it difficult you know I mean I'm talking about when I was like four or five years old so you know I'd go to school and my friends would be playing video games and and I'd be going home to practice the piano and I I found it you know like I didn't get to see the the wonder in it right away I think as a young kid I mean my parents love music and my grandparents were very musical um and so it was, you know, and I, and I loved singing, but in terms of the, the, the commitment and dedication to practicing and reading music, when I was very young, I found it, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't quite see the wonder of it. And, you know, years later I did, before I moved here, I did become a piano teacher and I made it my, my life's mission to, um, to ensure that the, the kids I was teaching understood what they could do with this, the, you know, what's very hard work. When you first learn the piano and you've got a synchronize two hands differently I mean it's it's a lot for a kid and it's a kind of it's a it's a motor functioning skill that you don't really do in a lot of other things at that age obviously in certain sports I, don't, I guess in gaming <laughs> but <laughs> but I mean it you know so you know I'd, I'd always ask I'd ask the kids like what's your favorite piece of music what do you love about you know is there a piece of music you like and I'd make an arrangement for them that was sort of hopefully to their skill level you know when you first learn a piece on the piano you the idea is not to actually have to move your hands at all so you can kind of um you can really feel your way through it you know to to show them because of course the irony being the piano has been the gateway to the most joy i could imagine in my life and i almost i almost wanted to give it up you know i told my parents oh you know do i have to do this this is hard and you know uh can i you know they say oh just do one do do you know do your grade one Oh, I should, that, that wasn't so bad. Oh, I did quite well in that. Do you agree? And then the really big change for me in my life was um, my grandfather had been to um, a uh, cathedral choir school, which is a very big tradition in, in English music. And it's actually also quite a big tradition in Hollywood music because composers like Harry Gregson Williams and Henry Jackman, um, I don't know yeah. if Dom went to a cathedral choir. Yeah, there was a, him, lot of, he's... a lot of choir boys, I think. Um, yeah, there's a lot of choir boys. Dave Buckley, around. I think. Dave Buckley, was... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my grandfather had done it. And I'd, I'd say this about, the, I'd found the piano just difficult, but I'd always loved singing. And I, 
I, you know, I, it's something I took to. And anyway, so I went to this, my grandfather had, had been to this choir school called St. George's Windsor Castle in England. And I went there um, and joined the choir and received just like a, a huge dose of musical training that I really think has, for me, has, has been the reason I've managed to succeed. Um, and, and just, you know, I was, my ears were being pummeled with the world's most beautiful choral music every day for, for four, four years. Um, and, and I loved it. And, and in, in that, um, in that process of loving it, I also became interested for the first time in the anatomy of music, how is harmony put together? You know, we, I went back to Windsor, it's been about four years since I went back. And the trebles obviously generally are singing their part. There's two sides, there's the canine and cantorus. And generally they're singing the same part. Sometimes you're singing different parts and there's seven, about seven boys on each side. But then there's this incredible blend of an all male, um, uh, I'd say backing track, you know, the, the altos or counter tenor, tenors and basses. And there's only, um, I think there's only two of each of those on each, no, there's four of those on each side, but they're all blended. And to me, you know, we were getting to be the, the kind of, you know, the passenger in the Ferrari, basically, because you're just hearing this incredible blend and beautiful harmony. And that is certainly what, what, you know, really, I think, inspired me. I didn't realize it at the time. So I, I, I first started to go, okay, well, I understand how this music's written, but I, I first started to be able to play by ear and all things that I think composers, you know, use all the time. So anyway, that was, I don't I know, harkened on the <laughs> choral thing a bit, but it really was, it really was amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, from there, I went on to a school called Marlborough College, which is in Wiltshire, um, as a music scholar. And, and you know, um, it, 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 the school became famous because it's where Kate Middleton actually went to school. <laughs> she was a bit, she was a few years older than me, but, um, and they had, you know, I first discovered like computers and using and using computers and Cubase and, um, you know, recording music. So I did music A level and music tech A level as well, much to the like shock of my parents. So I did history and math as well, just in case. <laughs> just, um, just in case, yeah. <laughs> just in case. But, you know, that, that, and they felt very separate, those two things, music tech and the kind of high, what, what you, you know, the prestigious music curriculum, you know, it, they felt very separate and, and music tech especially I sort of poured on my time and I you know we had compared to now we had just I don't know what kind of language I can use but just crap samples um shit samples, never, yeah. get, <laughs> shit samples. you can never you get anything to sound good but it it was <laughs> you know learning to sequence music and learning to produce music learning to you know learning to to make a demo um skills that are you know so important and and, and I, I suppose at that time they were becoming really important in, in Hollywood um it, it was that you know we had the shit samples because Hans was making the good ones over here <laughs> but but there wasn't like um anyway um Marlboro was great and it, it just gave me the it gave me the freedom to just tinker around I never yeah. wrote anything good I thought I was writing something okay <laughs> but and I suppose you get used to the feeling of creating, which I think early on is as important as the results themselves. If you can get through a piece, you know, finish things, and then and then you sort of go, okay, well, actually, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. was not too much. <laughs> but hopefully, each thing you write, you learn something about yourself and about it, and how to how to orchestrate, how to. I also at Marlborough, one of the things is that I I um I used to help out with the percussion, and I'd sit in the back of the orchestra. And I just listened to all the parts, you know, being rehearsed separately from the back of the orchestra, which I, I think was definitely really handy. Yeah, I can imagine um, that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, all these, all these early things. I mean, I guess now there's so much access um, to things online that we just didn't have then. So, I probably wasted a lot of time early on as well, wondering how to do things the wrong way, which now you you know well partly because of you, <laughs> there's all this information oh. <laughs> um you know i remember like once um i remember once looking for like a um like looking on some it was probably like dan goldwester's website or something and it was like photograph of harry gregson williams in the car park at remote control 
and that was like aspiring composer porn composer right. for like most it was like you know he was probably like tired and running home or something and somebody had got a photo <laughs> of him who, who was hanging out that was like the that was the the closest you could get to being to knowing what film music um yeah no i totally agree because i remember it, when when dvds came out and that was like the biggest thing when we had bonus features and you'd maybe you'd be lucky to get like a four minute feature with like a, with Hans or John Williams or something, but no one else would really, it would always be the directors and the actors. But when I saw like talking about film music, I was like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I like, I remember like the Lord of the Rings one was a big one that really sort of, you know, I don't think I even realized that. I, I don't know how it, I don't know how I thought it sounded as good maybe because there was a mixed mythology for my teachers who would say, oh yeah, all TV is sample. They just have better ones than us. And then knowing that, knowing that real recording sessions happened and that that magic, you know, happened, I it, I wasn't even aware of aware of that. I think um, I, you know, I knew lit, I knew very little. And but what I did know is that I loved, I loved writing music. And I, you know, I think one, one of my teachers um, uh, at, at Marlborough, which was like, uh, you know, you should you should look at film music. You know, that's how you can actually do this for a living and you should think about that so she definitely steered me sort of oh you know showed me oh there's a door no no one had any idea where it was but we knew <laughs> there was one that I could maybe look for um anyway then I went to Bristol uh where I studied music Bristol University so you know Windsor from London Windsor uh Marlborough Bristol which is just like each one a bit more west uh, and Bristol was great. I mean, really fun, really fun college town. It's it's very urban city. Like a lot of like dubstep and stuff or, originated there. Oh wow! So it's a really fun it's a really fun city, um, but it's also quite rural. So it's it was a lovely place to go to college. And um, you know, I I sort of I decided I'm not sure why I decided this, but I thought you know what I with no disrespect to musicians, I thought God, I'm probably going to hang out with musicians for the rest of my life. I'd love to go and have a college experience that I'll have friends for the rest of my life who do other things. So I don't mm. just become a pretentious shithead just who can literally only have a conversation about music, which is a very real thing. Yeah. If you hang yeah. around remote too long, people, we're all working on these things so much and we, you fall off a project and you're incapable <laughs> of actually knowing what else is going on in the world, which is a, you know, is a worry in our, in our business, but, um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, that's that's really one of the reasons I went to Bristol. And what I found there was, um, you know, I, I did some really fun classes in like um, pastiche composition, like writing in the style of like Haydn and uh, and Mendelssohn, and you know, writing string quartet stuff that I sort of thought as a snooty eighteen year old was like old and not cool. And but actually, again, I think back to the sort of fundamental skills has really helped me here you know yeah, just 100%. knowing how to knowing the grammar of of you know good music and that that I guess it's because that tradition has become such a big part of Hollywood music and there's a huge other side to it as well of course more contemporary uh, interesting interesting music that's going on but that kind of bedrock of, of grammar and good harmony and and knowing how to put something together like the, yeah. knowing how to build the house uh, and for it to sound good. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that was Bristol. And then it was there that I heard about this course, again, from Googling, um, I stumbled upon this thing called the SMPTV scoring program. Um, I can't remember, it was sort of meant some, someone, I think who'd worked for Christopher Young spoke about it just in passing. Oh yeah, I did this course, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, okay, there's a course that is in LA that does this thing. So, you know, I saved up and as I mentioned, I was a piano teacher and I took any, after after finishing my degree um, uh, at uh, in composition and I did do piano minor, by the way. So I persevered with the piano, which I love. And, you know, it's been, it's become, as I said, a huge part of my life. Um, uh, and then I, um, yeah, and then I made the leap to, to LA, which was about 10 years ago now. 
Yeah, uh, that must have I been. Mean, how was that? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of composers out there who are probably living in different parts of the world and are maybe contemplating. I mean, not, right now the world is broken right now, but maybe when things get yeah. better, uh, what what what, uh, what kind of were you nervous about moving to a new country? Were you uh, excited? What kind of was going through your head during that process? I mean, everyone's excited, I think, at the idea of moving to California and the mm -hmm. idea of, oh, my gosh, this is this is I think what I I realize is this is my reckoning like this is either I'm going to be able to somehow get into this business or some people, you know, SMP TV, I knew had a pretty good track record at, at feeding, um, you know, composers or I, or it's just like I'm, you know, this won't be I won't be able to do it, you know, and I had no idea. Obviously, I was nervous because the financial aspect was huge, you know, going, yeah. going to do an expensive course, which it's very expensive compared to English education. I guess it's, it's just a year of, you know, electives for yeah. pretty good value as American college goes. But for when you come from England, where at the time it was pretty cheap to go to, to, go to undergrad, um, it was daunting for sure. And, you're, and without any idea of how you could actually make, make your money back or or survive so absolutely it was stressful it was a really fun year I mean it went in about I mean it was only two semesters so it went very quick um, but the biggest takeaway from that was um, the orchestras mm. and you know we had these great sessions with the players who generously you know wanted to invest in the young students and young composers the players that we work with now um, were at our sessions and what that meant for me was really important was as a composer, you have these, there's this combination of abstract thought and very practical applied results. And obviously with cinema, it, it really is about results and impact. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're in college, scrabbling an orchestra together to play your music is a really difficult task. And there is an element where, you know, their hearts are sort of in it, but they're also worrying about the sports final that they're in the next day and the paper that they've got to you and you know x and x people don't turn up for the rehearsal and all sorts of variables and guess what your music isn't that good yet right. so in but in for in order for you to truly realize your music isn't that good yet you you kind of have to hear it in the best case scenario and that's what usc did for me um and sometimes i was amazed by oh my gosh i can do this that is the thing and then sometimes I was like, I can't believe you thought that was going to work. Um, and you, you know, and that's a that's an interesting thing about working in a sequencer with samples is that it can lead you astray in terms of what you, what what actually does work. And that's that's been an interesting thing to learn. Obviously, there are composers that write amazingly and have never used a computer, and they really know know how to do that. But it is an important part of our craft. So, you know, and, and also that um, democratization of samples which really has happened i'd say in the last 10 years since i left usc when i first finished at usc there were some libraries that were starting to come out where i was like okay that's actually that's a um you know consumer costed library that sounds like the thing that you're writing because obviously it's it's, it's a huge disconnect to go to keep making these adjustments and calculations going well i could write that except it doesn't it doesn't work because I don't have the sample mm -hmm. and that's very dysfunctional to accumulate those kind of habits um, so anyway U USC was really um, was really my sort of reckoning of that as well you know we had some great teachers we had Gary Scheinman um, Patrick Curse was brilliant Joel McNeely Bruce Broughton um, really great teachers um, but the big thing that came out of that for me was um, funnily enough, um, was a seminar with Harry Gregson Williams, mm. who, um, I think it was the, although we had amazing classes at USC, he was the only teacher the whole year. We went to his studio, which at the time was in Venice. Um, and he was the only teacher, you know, we went down there one week and then we came back and he generously had us back and he'd listened to all our stuff. And, uh, and he'd given us two, he'd given us two cue assignments, but he was the only teacher that gave us two cues from the same project. Cause it's a bit tiring, you, you know, it, 
uh, you you hope as a composer is you get to write a really good idea and then develop it a lot over a movie whereas right. at usc when you're a student you've got to come up with the idea and then that's it and you move on to the next thing so you've got these sort of unfertilized ideas that aren't <laughs> that great but at least the practice of developing ideas which is such an important part of our job um being able to take something that a director doesn't actually like and make apply it in the right way that they suddenly go oh you know i do like that now i just i was worried that you know because the arrangement wasn't right and so harry had us develop two cues over the same project which was really cool and then we did a cue from shrek as well and for me that was like look if i can't if i can't impress him again i knew that he'd had this choral background and i thought well, if, if anyone, if I can relate to anybody out here, it would be a composer like him. He's he's somebody that, you know, he was a, he was a role model. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, if I've got any hope of getting into this thing, I, um, you know, I, I've got to be able to do something he thinks good or I may as well go home. Uh, and then he very sweetly invited me to intern with him and I did some piano arrangements of his themes and, you know, would look at scores at Wavecrest and, and uh, you know, did some guitar. I think the first thing I did was some guitar lead sheets for George During for a session <laughs> on Cowboys and Aliens. And I remember like frantically putting like cues from, you know, he was like, he was like, you know, if you want, put some cues from the orchestra so that, you know, in case I have an idea, which I now realize as a composer, it's like, the ch what are the chances of a top composer arranger like Harry really deviating that much from his demo at the recording <laughs> session? Not really. But yeah. I was, well, I've got to have what the, you know, the violins are doing just in case he wants to double that because that's what he's asked for. And, you know, um, I actually think that um, Mary, um, Dave's wife, who was working for Harry at the time, she'd given me the stems and she's like, do you want click with them? And I was like, oh, no, I don't need the click. I'll just look at the MIDI. <laughs> and I just it was the worst decision I've ever made because it made the job <laughs> so difficult. Um, so anyway, you know, that was that was wonderful. And and. I, I, you know, he, he, and then he'd said, oh, you know, because Halley Cawthry, who was working with him at the time, was kind of moving on and said, you know, come in and let's get you a room. And he introduced me to Sam Schwartz and was like, you know, this is Anthony, he's coming on board and all this stuff. And then he went and decided to do his sabbatical in Stowe. And so he, he rang me up and he said, I'm so sorry, man. I, I, I'm actually deciding that I, I kind of, I need to just take a break. Um, and, uh, you know, I need to take a break and I need to recharge my batteries and I, I kind of need to downsize everything. And, you know, my, my studio is just is, is a whole big thing and I just want to downsize, which he, he subsequently did. So he went back to England um, and I went to work for, at his recommendation, I went to work for Hater Ferreira at, at RCP, which was really interesting for me because I'd never, I didn't know Hater's music and he has a very different approach. Obviously, he's a wonderful guitar player and has, you know, his guitar playing has been such an important heart of a lot of composers at Remote Control. And he has a very different approach to me. Um, and it was, you know, it was a great sort of first assistantship, um, you know, and he grew to trust me a lot. And I worked on Despicable Me Too and Smurfs Too with him. Right, right, yeah. But I sort of, you know, I knew in my heart, I was like, there's more, I have, I have more to give and I have something a bit different than he needs to give. And in that time, um, I had met John Powell, who ironically had done an internship with the SMP TV our year, but it was assigned in the first week. And I can't remember why it was assigned now. It was just sort of, it was a sign. I thought, gosh, I haven't had a chance to prove myself. And and by the way, I mean, one of the really important things that happened right before I went to, to move to America was I saw How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah. And I was like, wow, who is that? <laughs> and I'd known John's Bourne scores, um, but I didn't, it's funny, I, I sort of seen, you know, it's funny how optics are. I'd known about Harry as well, because he'd, he'd been in London sort of more recently. Um, or he was, you know, I'd known about him because he was a musical director of a thing that my sisters were in, you know, when he was kind of, before he moved to LA. So I sort right. of was more aware of Harry, I suppose. And, um, and uh you know, and it, it sort of, it was music by Harry Grayson Williams and John Powell. And I was like, okay, well, that's nice. But, but you know, I guess Harry's, Harry's the, the, the main guy on that kind of thing, which is not fair at all. Um, and then Dragon for me was just like, blew, like, like most people in film music just blew all of our minds. And yeah, um, yeah. 
so anyway so you know i went through usc going damn it i didn't get the chance to do the internship at john's um it was a little bit like the episode of the bachelor where you don't get the rose you know <laughs> right. <Damn it>. <laughs> somehow somehow i've fallen into watching yet another season of the bachelor and i always ask myself why at the end like how i blame emily my my fiance anyway um so uh so anyway but then i did end up meeting john um and we actually played tennis a little bit and he was just immediately just so modest i mean as you know him you've interviewed yeah. many times i i was sort of blown away by how understated he was in the way that he talked about his work which is something i've tried especially coming out of rcp with no disrespect to composers here but it was very refreshing and different um anyway i think you know through that i i chatted to him a little bit and i i think one day i just asked him i said hey i'm i'm thinking that i've got you know more to give um and uh do you need anybody? And he, he was kind of very slow at the time, but he was doing Rio too. And he said, uh, he said, yeah, well, I don't think I need anyone on Rio, but, but I've got this dragon film, you know, it, like <laughs> threw it away as if, <laughs> and, you know, bear in mind, everyone in the film music community was sitting there going like, wait, uh, hang on a second. Like what's John Powell going to do for dragon too? Like it right. was, we were all on the edge of our seats. And I just, I just remember going like, well, you know, I might need a, I might need a third guy on that, you know, kind of thing. And I, right at the time I left working at Hato, I was like, I, well, what happens? And, and for people that are, I think it's important for people who might be interested in, in me as somebody who's a bit younger and kind of done a lot of assisting additional music. Um, it's hard to get a jo job assisting right away because people want experience. But if you can survive, like a year, year and a half, get to know other assistants at RCP, become kind of part of the community, everyone will want to hire you when you leave. Mm -hmm. So not because of me, and you know, I think people knew me as a, someone who was friendly and always tried to keep, keep a brave face on things, but they didn't necessarily know what I was capable of or not capable of, but they saw somebody who could take it, <laughs> essentially. <Yeah. laughs> who could stand the, you know, who could stand the, the work-life balance and all that stuff. So I did get a lot of requests to be an assistant after I after I left, but John was like, oh, "You shouldn't be doing assisting anymore. You should be writing." Um, and um, I think I sent him an email. Um, I mean, you know, I won't go into any details about, about other people, but um, but I sent him an email and um, was just like, "Hey, you know, there's these things," and he said, "Well, I was just thinking you could help me on this Rio thing I'm doing." So after all, you know, and then and I worked with him on that and I honestly had the time of my life. I, back to the samples thing, I was working on a template for the first time that was incredible, that you could write something, you know, and it, it would, it, you could realize your kind of orchestrational fantasies, I guess. Right. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's so brilliant about John, of course, is that he has this incredible body of work that there wasn't a lot of, um, and it's something I'm now at this very young part of my career trying to trying to build myself. There wasn't a question of like, well, will John like that? I mean, of course, you're always asking yourself that question. But um, uh, Batu Senna and I have this joke that it's like, um, well, you know, you could just look at like how I've done it in 50 other scores I've done kind of thing. <laughs> because, he, you know, he really has he set a standard with his work. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I wasn't asking him questions endlessly. I was thinking, well, I guess if I if I can and and that's when you see a love in someone else's in the way someone else's mind works and when you um you you connect to it and you aspire to it that's so important and and that made that it just made it a joy um and then that one then went on to Dragon 2 um and then that really sort of set me up to be you know an additional music composer on on a lot of family and animations and and um you know, and obviously I've been doing that a lot. Um, and, you know, I've been really lucky to be kind of one of the, the go-to people for that. Yeah, and, and, you know, because of that work with John, I was really lucky that that led to, you know, um, led to a really great relationship as well with Henry Jackman, who, you know, is in his own way is, is sort of in another life was definitely an English schoolmaster and, you know, loves to, 
you know, although he's very private, he, he really loves to foster and, 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 you know, he holds us, he holds us composers to a really high standard. And, you know, I've learned a lot from, from Henry and he's, he's been really sweet and, and supportive as well. And, and actually also led me, led me back to Harry and, and I helped him, um, you know, supported him a little bit on the Martian. And, you know, I've always loved his music and, you know, I mean, his Shrek scores and all his Tony Scott scores. And, you know, he, and actually he very, Funnily enough, sweetly emailed me the other day about Promise Young Woman, and he was like, "Oh, I was so happy to see you're doing this." So, you know, I think this this community it's it's really a long term it's really a long term thing. You know, I don't think anyone should think of it as, "Oh, okay, I did that gig. Okay, don't need to talk to them anymore." It's really, a, I mean, it's a cliche to say it, but it's really a family. You know, yeah. And you yeah. want to invest in those relationships with, you know, with those composers. Apart from anything else, it's such a. I mean, one of the one of the great takeaways, so much of my early composing life was um, you're sort of on your own and you don't really know what you're doing. But as soon as you start sharing music and if, and if it's other people's music that you're being, that they're sharing with you and inviting you to, you know, be an additional music composer with them and trusting you with it. It's yeah. inc- I mean, forget Hollywood or forget success or forget fame. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling to participate in someone else's music and and to have them participate in yours um, and to sort of understand it, you know, with these rigs that they will match and you can pass an arrangement around between different minds. And that I, you know, I really, I really love that. And I, you know, it's something I, I never sort of thought that I'd, I'd have. So, um, so yeah, you know, Henry, Henry and, and Harry as well, and John and, you know, lots of other composers I've been lucky to learn from and, and work with and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, that's a lot of waffle, but that's sort of my kind of no, that's uh, getting into it. It's amazing uh, journey that you've you've had, and I mean, you've worked with Henry Jackman and you know Don Lewis and all these other people too, who, you know, and you know, and John, of course, being a big part of your career as well. So it's a, uh, but I mean, your your solo work as well. I'd love to just kind of dive into some of your uh, your your scores. Um, because uh, you got to work on, I think you got you got to jump into video games pretty early. You got to work on Fortnite, and then of course Knack Two, which is a fantastic score. I love Knack Two. Oh, thank you. So, so talk about that because usually, uh, you know, it's weird because a uh, video there's like, there's like video game composers, film composers. Every now and then, sometimes you know, a film composer will jump to the video game world and vice versa. But you kind of got you got placed in there pretty early. Uh, what was it like scoring? You know, kind of this interactive media. Yeah, Knack, Knack Two was my first sort of proper, proper gig, and and you know that Sony were looking for somebody who was kind of an animation composer. Yeah, and they wanted initially quite a colourful score. In the end, I think that the the developers felt that it needed to be a little bit more, a little bit more macho rather than a kind of Pixar score. So we we changed it up a little bit. But um, yeah, it was really fun. I mean, it's it was very new for me in like figuring out how to write modular music that harmonically doesn't change a lot with the different layers. So you can, you know, you can combine things um, and you can, you can modulate between the different intensities and, you know, Sony PlayStation, luckily for me, have an amazing team that actually does the implementation. Mm -hmm. Unlike, you know, a lot of more indie, indie games, I think composers can be very heavily involved in that. Um, And actually, In many cases, even you know, use the software like uh, Wise and that, that implements the music in the game. They they very kindly spared me that, but they did push me very hard to make sure that they had all the musical elements and components, and that they would work and that they would function um, together. And you know, it was my first time sort of writing a lot of themes, which you know I now look back as really quite simple. But I I enjoyed. You know, I really enjoyed sort of coming up with my own mythology for the characters and the goblins and the Armageddon machine and, you know, the friendship and heroic themes. And it was, you know, it was fun and there was a lot of music um, and it was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I love doing it. I think what I, what I immediately began to realize, which I found harder about games than films is um, when you get a movie, hopefully, you have a sort of full structure in place and you can kind of see where it crescents, what right. you can kind of diagnose your shopping list of what you need. <laughs> and with video games, it's a little bit more like, you know, and of course the way you experience video games is also very different. It, it, you un- it unfolds in a more sort of um, sprawling and, and organic way mm-hmm. rather than a very cu- curated experience. Um, but I found 
I found it sort of hard being like, oh, but is this the big bit for the tune or is it, should I be less here? Where's the, you know, tell me where the like, you know, like as Danny Elfman would say, like, where's the bit where I really have to bring my theme out of the cupboard? Like mm -hmm. where, you know, where's that moment? Um, and uh, so I found that, I found that challenging actually. Cause you kind I of- I can imagine, yeah. yeah and, and especially as, you know, as I'd learned from John and Henry, that, that you know, a very, um, you know, they have quite a, a high, a high bar for thematic logic, you yeah. know, using themes in the right ways, especially John. Yes. Uh, and it's one of the things that makes this scores so amazing and so impactful, you know, and so games are different with that. You, you, I probably was being too, um, uh, too picky about how I was using them where really it, it doesn't matter. You just need to write a cool piece of music. Right. Um, right. So, but that no, was great. And we, you know, we did some, awesome percussion with Brian Kilgore and I got to work with Chris Blair for the first time recorded in Nashville which is a really great place to record I know they're working on this new hall which is going to be really interesting to see yeah um, it's, it's a sure. booming city for music yeah yeah so yeah I mean no that was great and um yeah I love I loved it I mean it was yeah it was, it was really fantastic fun. yeah fantastic game fantastic score um and then you also recently got to you kind of almost full circle came back and you know uh, I got to score How to Train Your Dragon Homecoming, which was the uh, holiday special. Uh, talk about, a pro, you know, you've worked with John on, on uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2 and, and, uh, and, the, and uh, Hidden World. And talk about kind of bringing it home and also being respectful to his themes, but also trying to maybe bring your voice into it. Was that a challenge? The very first, when I, f like, I think my first week on Dragon uh, 2, I, I felt you know a sense of uh, as a fan of Dragon One as a as a you know I felt a sense of like knowing how things ought to be. So I remember being a bit shocked when John sort of presented these new themes, and I was like, "Oh, but that but everybody loves the old stuff. Like, what? Why would you? You know, in my naivety, thinking, oh, but you know, um, why would you? Why would you have these new things? And of course, the characters had evolved and and what John does so amazingly is he attaches themes to emotions. Um, and let's say if one, you see it a lot in sequels with temps where they'll use the existing music and they'll, they'll put it, um, they'll put it sort of all over the place. You know, I saw it in pirates with Jess and Ellie and, and, yeah, yeah. and, and it, it makes you feel at home because you recognize it from the franchise, but there's always something a bit diminishing about it because if you're attaching a theme that, used to be pertained to one thing onto a new thing you're sort of undermining the um uh the the potency that it had yeah the weight it, uh, the emotional weight of it uh, yeah whatever it was attached to originally yeah what it was written for yeah, yeah. so it, it sort of trivializes it a bit and uh, and anyway that's something that john showed me um much to my sort of amazement uh, at the time which you know it it seems obvious now but at the time I, I just didn't have the maturity or understanding to to know that, and um, you know I think that there was famously outcry in in Howard Shaw Howard Shaw scores for the uh, for the Hobbit movies because of some temping like that, you know, right. of, of attaching ringwraith music to to small music and things like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure of the details, but um, but so anyway, my approach having done having seen John go through that process on um, Dragon Two and then the Hidden World. It, you know, I was so lucky that I'd seen that and been a part of that because when it came to Homecoming and then, you know, it was amazing that uh, John very sweetly spotted the film with me and director Tim Johnson, who ironically was uh, John's first animation director, uh, one yeah. of the two directors on Ants. Oh, that's right, um, yes. So I definitely was having an out-of-body experience there. <laughs> going, Wait, this is crazy. This is, I was like, when they were doing that, I was, you know, still singing. Yeah. Um, pretty much. So, um so that really equipped me, that experience with John on those two films really equipped me to, to know how to tackle it. And then he also spotted it and, and he himself said, well, no, you should have a new theme for memory. So that was the emotional um, centerpiece of Homecoming. And it, you know, it was only a, a short, short film, but it still, it did have some space if you knew where to look for it. And that, I think mm, that's the yeah. thing about, it's about knowing, knowing when you, when something needs something. And, 
knowing and that's what john's so brilliant at knowing when you can you can push for something emotional where you know of course you can get through a film with trems and pitzes but nobody's going to take anything from that um, right uh it's just going to keep the thing kind of humming along a bit but um so that was how that was the emotional bodger and then obviously in because the story of homecoming pertained to retelling the story of how to train a dragon one there was a lot of opportunities to use themes and use his existing themes and, and weave them in. And then in my memory tune, I, I definitely really tried to strongly evoke some of the beautiful themes he's written, like the Lost and Found tune and little yes. things, little motifs and things, but but in but keep it feeling like its own its own piece. And then I also um, had the chance to do a new kind of playful theme for the nightlights, uh, who are the baby, baby uh, night fury, light fury. <laughs> offspring um so so it was wonderful i mean uh, it really was um a great way to kind of i hope show john everything i i tried to learn from him you know uh so i i'm really you know i love doing it um and then we got to record in london for the first time you know it was my first project recording in london uh as the session leader and and that was crazy for me too i mean it it was it's always been crazy for me that it was like a homecoming I, for you it was like a big homecoming for well, you well yeah <laughs> not yeah. to get too cheesy yeah. and lame but it was <laughs> no it was it was and you know the story also the subject matter of the thing is all about preserving memory and passing things on and yeah. you know hiccup trying to preserve the memory of his father so there was definitely like john would hate that analogy but i you know i was i was do i did you know i was shit scared that all the fans would go well who who the fuck is this like yeah, you right. know we want john powell and, and it's been really nice to see that people really enjoyed it and felt that that i respected what he what he made yeah. um and uh yeah and, and recording in london i mean it's it's crazy to me how many hollywood movies were being recorded and have been recorded you know a few miles from where my parents live right and so strangely enough there i was feeling so disconnected to hollywood music and how can i get into that how can i you know get into that whereas if, if i maybe if i'd been in the right pub at the right time i might have bumped into tony lewis or something right would have, yeah. you know been like oh <laughs> you know my son that it, it's so you know film scoring is so um it's so uh, it really you know it's heart does kind of beat in london so yes. often um and and yet i still had to come here to to go back to it um so anyway yeah that project was was amazing and and uh, i'm really lucky to have done it yeah, it turned out beautiful. And, uh, you know, I remember sitting there in your studio and you're showing me kind of the early things you were doing. It was really, really great. And I think the finished product is fantastic. Um, but uh, I do want to talk, I want to jump, you know, into Promising Young Woman because this film is uh, getting so much buzz and, and it's just a fantastic piece of cinema. And you got to work with this great writer director, um, you know, Emerald, uh, uh, Emerald Fennel, sorry. Yes, Emerald Fennel. And uh, so, yeah, let's talk about it. How, so, you know, it's uh, directed by Emerald Fennel and starring great, I mean, amazing cast, Carrie Mulligan, Adam Brody, Bill amazing Brown, cast. Alison Brie, I mean, Clancy Brown and so many others. How did you get involved with this and what were kind of uh, your first conversations about music? Yeah, I mean, the cast is like such a wish list of, it's like even the small parts are like rammed yeah. full of like <laughs> major celebrities, which is, was slightly baffling to me. Um, I was like, wow, that is incredible for a first film. Um, Oh, Emerald's just a brilliant person. I think we're all seeing that she hasn't even started, really. I mean, yeah, she's I mean, really... she's she's kind of getting into writing, directing as well. I mean, she's she's also an actress as well and a novelist. And I mean, she's uh, kind of a you know jack of all trades, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, funnily enough, Emerald did. I mean, talk about nepotism. Uh, didn't get me the gig, but I I did know who Emerald was because she she did go to the same school as me um mm. but she was much older and i knew who she was because she was th this amazing act actress in the plays and so i was uh, always aware of her um and then strangely enough she was actually in a scene that i was working on for john in pan she's the uh she's a sort of flight commander That's in right. the room of when they're, yeah. yeah they're trying to escape to neverland and meanwhile there's this whole kind of blitz going on and the, and the and the British Army, uh, uh, the British Air Force, sorry, uh, are uh, instructing this, um, you, you know, attack or whatever was going on, and and uh, that was Emerald's part. 
And then I, I bumped into her at a friend's party and she'd moved to LA or she was sort of scouting to see if she wanted to move, I think. And we had a chat about that and we got on well and I saw her a few more times. And and then she, and, you know, she was aware of what I was doing and um, and the films I'd, I'd been a part of. And she, I think, you know, she first, she, she came up to me and she just said, yeah, I, I just want to get your advice about, um, about my film, I've just finished it. Um, and I said, uh, I said, great, what, what kind of film is it? She says, it's a dark comedy thriller horror film. And I went, it's sort of every composer's <laughs> nightmare, I think, when they hear about a film is going, I have no idea what that feels like. I don't, yeah. I mean, if you, tell, if you tell somebody you're making a Peter Pan movie, you go, okay, I get roughly what that's gonna be. Maybe there'll right. be some edgy, cool new character and they'll want it a bit more contemporary and dark, but I, I literally had no idea what that would feel like. And um, you immediately, I mean, every time I hear of, of, of a project, I immediately start ticking to go, okay, well, how would I do that? Yeah. And I, I was left feeling like, oh my God, I, <laughs> I hope she doesn't ask me to do this because this sounds really hard um, and really different and, and nothing like anybody's done before. So, um, and then she sent me an email and, and uh, you know, and, and she sweetly sent me the film to watch. Uh, and, and I still, well, no, actually, I sort of took from that, well, you just want my advice. So I said, well, look, why don't you talk to my agents? And they've got loads of great composers. Um, why don't you talk to them? And, and, and you know, like any friend I know socially, I, I'd like to make them feel like they get what they want and not necessarily right. and stick my nose in it and be like, okay, well, I'll score your film, you know. I, it it's not something that it's not something that feels good to me like you want to be you want to be asked to do it um but to, much to my agents um uh kudos kudos to them that they said well no this is the kind of film you should really be trying to get for you and, and you know let's talk to emerald and and i think deep down emerald was just curious because she was making quite a contemporary film yeah. she was curious to get the perspective of somebody who'd kind of come from more of a thematic orchestral background because she knew that she was going to have a very strong pop um music sort of thread to the movie and i think she was wondering okay but how can i i want you know like i guess like her shopping list her, her wish list for her cast and her yeah. wish list for her um the songs in the movie which are amazing uh she was like no i want for my first movie i want like a, a thematic score i want a theme for my character i don't want this to go on unsung so i had a call with sue jacobs who's an amazing legendary music supervisor he'd been on the project for quite a while um and she and emerald and i had a call with emerald and they both said hey can you can you write a theme can you see if you can find a theme like you know i, I sent them both an email about how much i enjoyed the movie and what i'd taken from it and they said you know what would you what do you feel about a theme do you think that the character can, can take a theme and anyway i you know, went off and, and, and played around and wrote something and, um, you know, heard from Emerald, you know, a couple of days later saying the more I listen, which I, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to send this off. Like you so often do with demoing, you send it off, you never hear anything. Right. That's it. But, you know, I guess I, I'd, I'd had a proper conversation with Sue and Emerald. So they, they were somewhat invested, I think. Um, you, at which point, you know, for anybody listening about, you know, the power of writing a demo, it's like, it's a hotly contested thing. But for me, it totally got me the gig. And I wouldn't be probably doing this interview with you right now if, if, uh, if it, ha you know, if I hadn't gone on, on the weekend to write that theme. Um, you know, and, it, and I guess what I'd say about that is it's always worth trying to write a good, so again, something I've learned from John, it's always good trying to write a good idea because yeah. you can reuse things and it like a good idea is a good idea musically it has a if it has like a logic to it if it has something that that sort of pulls you pulls you along about it then you'll it's worth like a like a wood shop building up those ideas because eventually you, then you'll have enough it's not worth it if you just do it once right the chances of that thing being the perfect thing statistically for whatever you're doing another time or whatever you need um is very low but if you have enough of them you'll suddenly you i think the quality of your music and your scores will go up because you come to a project armed with 
with good ideas that again going back to what i said earlier that will will be successful in being impactful yeah and uh, john is one of those people that i know he doesn't toss out stuff if he has something that gets rejected or something he'll you know try to you know play with it and ironically he also has a wood shop <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's why I, 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 it's all. His <laughs> I know. I was like the woodshop <laughs> reference. I'm like, oh, he has one. <laughs> yeah, so it's so, yeah, known to a lot of people. Uh, John does woodwork. Yeah. <laughs> that was slightly deliberate. Yeah. Um, no, he's very good at it too. Um, uh, and um, yeah, no. So um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So uh, so and so I wrote that theme and sent it off, and and Emerald. Um, and then we'll send me an email back saying the more I listen to this, the the, the more I the more I love it. Um, and that got me got me the project. And you know, it was really interesting learning. She it, she's a very hands on person and so good at leading, and so kind of focused and calm. And um, she's 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 really. I mean, I just can't wait to see what she does for the rest of her career because she has a way with people and she has a way she has a way at reacting to things and. You know, sometimes you go on like you go on experiments, you go around the houses right there on the spot, you know. Um, but she, you know, she really she really pushed a, a kind of classic thriller um, vibe. You know, obviously the film itself goes through, modulates through a lot of genres. And, you know, initially yeah. the first the first act is very kind of playful horror. I think Emerald felt that she wanted to sort of tease people about, wait, what film did I just walk into? Is she going <laughs> to kill everybody? And you know, which I think that kind of playfulness makes composers nervous because most of the time we're trying to, you know, occupy ourselves um, making you feel very comfortable in the movie you're in right. and not and making you go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, you can finish your thought, but I'm just curious about approaching that tone because I think creating, you know, music is such a big part of the tone. I'm sure that the songs will also help, but how did you, how was that, how did that, uh, how was your role in that and making sure that you were, it's a, you know, black comedy, thriller, horror. And it's like, how, as a composer, where do you start and what is the tone of the film? How, what is the tone of the music that you wanted to write? I mean, I think the overall tone of the film is actually irony. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a con there isn't a constant tone. It's it's something. It's so original in its tone, and it's so it's so sort of bizarrely successful at on the one hand making you feel. Have you had a chance to see the film yet? By the way, Kyle? I have not seen it. Sort of no, I haven't. You haven't seen it. No, no. I, was, I was just curious. Um, it it um, well, you'll find out that you, on the one hand, you're you're sort of questioning your your role as a male in society as a as as a man watching it. And right. then on the other, Which I was going to ask you about in, later. <laughs> Continue. Oh sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, on the other, you're kind of entertained. Um, uh, well, you're very entertained. You're laughing, yeah. and 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 you're feeling deeply ashamed at the same time. And I think, you know, obviously, women watching it have even deeper emotional um, reactions to it. And and uh, and uh, it, it's so. I mean, really, the tone. That what I tried to do with the score was, you know, keep a thematic through line that could modulate, um, and and you know, the one of the one of the really important things about the film was um, there's an elephant in the room where the, this main character Nina, who actually doesn't appear in the film, but the whole film is about her and her experience, mm -hmm. and the trauma that that's caused her her to ultimately commit suicide which is the implication and um the trauma it's caused her best friend whose sort of whole life has gone has been put on hold basically she's she's ceased to exist in her own right and that's why it's called promising young woman because she was she had everything going for her until this thing happens right. right and so you know when i was first working on the theme what i realized was that it was um it wasn't really cassie's theme or carrie mulligan's character's theme it was the theme for this lost friendship and so by bringing, by bringing this sort of lost friendship into the film, I was able to bring the character of Nina into the film, even though she wasn't really there. Um, which, you know, I think often people talk about like hats on hats or, you know, you don't want the score to just reiterate what you're seeing all the time. Obviously like environmental music's great sometimes, you know, if you're in the desert hearing cool Lawrence of Arabia, it, it is really helpful in, in like selling the geography of things. but 
I think scores that can can show you something that isn't what you're seeing are, are always really interesting and they're obviously much braver um so um so yeah i mean that was the the, the approach was okay how can we you know how can we support this journey of this woman who's in um you know she's in a kind of purgatory and and can you know and will she get out of it and of course you know the middle of the middle act of the film she goes off on this romantic fairy tale so i took the same theme and I did a very romantic, you know, Emerald said, May, I want this to be the most romantic thing you can write. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we got to record in Vienna and uh, which was, which was really, really interesting. And um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, and it's so exciting to see, and of course, well, the, the, the really big uh, centerpiece musically in the film, or at least in the score is, is uh, Toxic. Yes. Which is this, um, it was in the trailer, I think they had, uh, right? Did they use that in the trailer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's something that Emerald, um, it's something that Emerald had uh, said had a vision for, um, very early on, and um, you know, I think in her first email, she said, "I'm experimenting with Britney and Wagner again," and I was like, "Fantastic!" I still have no idea what your film sounds like. <laughs> Britney and Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> what a combo. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, great. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah, so every composer's nightmare, but um, but also, I mean, just so interesting. And um, and what and so then what she had me do was take, you know, do a, a, a slowed down walked string quartet arrangement of it. Um, and it's it's so clever because it's well, on the one hand, it also was able to be the kind of bridge where the score and the songs meet. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, it's a string, it's you're hearing a string palette, but you're hearing a pop song. So it's kind of where that irony just all comes comes together into focus, which is uh, the for the third, you know, initiates the third act of the film. But, you know, most of the songs that are used in the film, obviously they're, they're proper pop covers done by some really fantastic Capitol um, Records artists. Um, and uh, it was exciting to see that that in fact the soundtrack has won the uh, HMA HMMA award. Yeah, HMMA is yeah. The, yeah. Um, um, anyway, so I'm I'm I uh, so Toxic isn't on the score album. It's on it's on that album. So I'm a bit jammy that I'm I'm part of that. But it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, never thought I would be. Um, never thought I'd be on, on an album with Paris Hilton, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so, so I, mean, I mean, focusing on toxic, uh, and the film is tackling toxic masculinity, and in a very bold and stylized uh, way, and so, uh, I mean, we mentioned earlier, but as a man, and you're working with this fantastic, you know, female writer-director, uh, what was your perspective going through it? I mean, uh, did it change your views at all? I mean, uh, did it open your, eyes, open your eyes up to a world that, you know, Sometimes, you know, it's funny because I, I, when I first started dating my current wife, it's just like she would tell me these things about what she's experiencing and never knew about any of these things. You know, you know, I, I consider myself to be a very polite and, you know, try to be the best person I can be. And, you know, but you see how, yeah, people who say, oh, yeah, I'm a good guy. And you see these, you know, you hear these terrible stories and stuff like that. I'm wondering if it opened your eyes at all or changed your point of views in any way. Well, you just said it. You said, yeah, but, but I'm a good guy. And yeah, that's good exactly guy. what you're. That's exactly what you see, you know. So I, I wasn't doing anything. Yeah, but I'm a um, good guy. Oh, yeah. a absolutely no. It, it the, the at least the you know the first act of the movie is very much preoccupied by showing you that that third camera. It's like you're seeing. It's like wait, I've seen this before, but I'm seeing it from the from a different point. The camera yeah. is somewhere else, right? And because because that camera is somewhere else, I can see how sleazy this guy is like i mean it's it's cringe it's it makes you cringe it makes yeah, you cringe as yeah. a male and it, it makes you feel probably very angry as a as a female and it's 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 deeply uncomfortable and as i said yeah. yet it's the way that it comments on it it's it's sort of entertaining uh it's it's truly brilliant and i think that's a big reason people are it's such an imaginative and still very pervasive way of telling of, of uh you know of uh making the point about our culture yeah, rather than yeah. it be kind of pre it's not preachy it's not which it would be so easy to do with this subject matter 100 percent, yeah um 
it, it yeah it, it's it's even like having this conversation it's just like reminding me how how clever emerald is <laughs> yeah because i mean that's the beauty of film is you can that's you know i, I just love film as, as an art form because yeah you take you're exploring the human condition and you take something that's such an important topic and just making this a creative you know just explosion of ideas and and storytelling and, and style and substance and all that and having something just here you go this is this is filtered through you know somebody and their point of view of everything and i think it's a I think I just just it just makes you love what you do, you know, love what you're part of, and this whole thing, you know, the whole filmmaking world. Yeah, I mean, so we have to text me when you watch it because I'm like, I feel like you captured it so just in what you're saying. I feel like you captured so much of what of what it covers, and um, yeah, I mean, it. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, I feel really lucky and proud, and and I'm not a, I'm not a woman, but I. I'm just very honored to be part of telling this story, which, you know, I, I really, I'm just sort of uh, being Emerald sort of musical assistant to, to help her convey what, um, you know, I mean, also, you know, Carrie's, Carrie's performance is so evocative. Oh, yeah. that that's what just did so much of the emotional heavy lifting for me that that's what, that's what inspired the theme. And, and that's, you know, and then, um, yeah, beyond that, I mean, it, the film kind of speaks for itself really yeah 100 percent. and and i mean congrats man like i mean the national board of review and new york film critics online you know listed as one of the top 10 films of, of 2020 and kansas city film critics circle and san diego film critics society and music city film critics association all named it the best film of 2020 so it's getting and you know of course just in general the critics and everybody and, and people buzzing and talking about it so it's getting a lot of great uh and it's, it looks like it's affecting people and reaching people and it's uh and a great, awesome debut. So it's awesome, man. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I'm super lucky. You know, I, I think it's it's just, it's really wonderful to kind of work really hard. You know, sometimes a lot behind the scenes and then, you know, to get to get some recognition and be, and, and really be a part of something that's getting a lot of recognition. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm more than, you know, it. it I, I, I hope I have got many, much better and more scores in me but um but uh it, it, i'm really lucky to be a part of this one for sure and yeah and uh i mean you're one of the most humblest and, and you know modest people i know and you've worked so hard and i've you know known you for several years now and we're both kind of uh you know going through our separate career paths so it's always been fun to to kind of check in and, and see how you're doing and <laughs> and see you grow and you've and you've been just I mean, you're so talented, man. So it's just been a joy for me to listen and, and, and everything. So. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, no, I mean, like, you know, back to the, the 15 year old me would be like super appreciative for, um, you know, for the light that you shine on composers and give, give people insight. You know, I, it's sort of like, I'm sort of almost like, Kaya, stop it. We've got enough composers. Stop, <laughs> stop helping, helping everybody know what's going on. <laughs> Uh, but I saw a hole, time. and I, I, you know, I saw a hole of stuff that I thought people would like. So that's what I, that's what I started with. Like, I want to see more of people talking like this about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it's, it's really nice to be able to talk. And, and actually, I think one thing I've also learned from John is that that ultimately, tools and knowledge, well, knowledge is a tool, and and it's really what you do with things, you know. Um, like John Powell's been so so gracious in in you know allowing me to work in the studio a lot and I've done a lot of my own projects there, but it doesn't mean I instantly just because you have access to somebody's computer doesn't mean you've got access to their mind, right? You know, and we use all these tools, but ultimately it it really is it's it's about the personality and, and making that come through. I used to be a question that used to infuriate me that my you know. I wouldn't name anybody, but like distant aunts and uncles would, <laughs> would sort of say, not, you know, not, not close family, but, you know, extended family. Let's yeah, say, yeah, yeah. would go, oh, and do you have software to help you with the harmony and the, and help you do the thing? And I was just like, no, like, <laughs> do you have somebody help you write your emails? You know, <laughs> no, it's, they're tools and they're amazing tools, but ultimately like, we've really got to like try and push our own personalities. So I'm all for everybody having access to to be able to bring out bring out what you know they can do, um, yeah, yeah. and not feel not feel restrained because that is something that has been. I mean, 
but it has been really hard to write music. And now I think we're at a point where you can get a pretty good rig for not, you know, too many thousand dollars um, and, and have an orchestra and, and, and have lots of, lots of cool synths and lots of, you know, lots of cool guitar samples and you can, you can do so much now. So um, that's why the world is, you know, it's flooded with lots of young composers. Yeah. And, and it's across all of, not just uh, film and music. I mean, you have, I mean, our phones are getting yeah. so good. Like, I mean, you have filmmakers that can go out with just this and yeah. like even Steven Soderbergh is making, a, you know, he made a movie just with this and you have other great filmmakers who are like, oh, I have, you know, a, I can shoot 4K and Dolby Vision on my phone now. It's like, you know, <laughs> so I think it's just yeah. making it more accessible to a lot of younger talent, which is good to see. And, uh, and I think your story has been such a fascinating one and, and you've done so much. And I, that's why I'm, I'm excited to have you here. So I hope people listening get to learn a lot. And, uh, you know, I think you're such a great example of what hard work and perseverance and, and personality and just kind of, you know, slowly making it into it and, and, and making these giant leaps and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, hopefully I'm an interesting kind of midway hybrid of, you know, <laughs> somebody who still doesn't still remembers what it was like to go can I ever have a career in music and yeah I think we all we all still feel like that you know especially oh, with the pandemic yeah. like you know any anything can change so quickly so you know feel really lucky to do it and and uh yeah no it's it's been I, I never thought I'd get to do what I've got to do so um you know I hope I hope you know younger composers know that that is possible at the end of the day you know we're all just human beings and yeah. these are just these are jobs that do need to be done by somebody and they're right. a lot of work too so they're a lot of work yeah it's a lot of to, work if you're willing to do that you know um and and uh you know and, and you you know you you're passionate I, I think you know that that's those are the mo most important things absolutely well anthony i want to thank you so much for chatting and then just you know just uh, talking about your process and sharing your your story and 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 digging into promising young woman and uh we'll be doing this again soon for sure and then we can rewind and watch it back in 15 20 years so <laughs> yeah i i as i as i uh spend more and more time in the studio i kind of come across old videos or old photos and i go god why didn't you take more because <laughs> because <laughs> because it only goes downhill from here so yeah it's really nice you know it's nice to have a record of, of those things i'm not somebody who has ever really kind of invested a lot in 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 that sort of thing of you know i, I like to kind of just live in the moment and not spend a lot right. of time or used to you know uh anyway so thank you no it's it's going to be good to do that i think yeah absolutely